Hey everyone, Pastor Tim here with you, Senior Pastor of Community of Grace Lutheran Church in Peoria, Arizona. It is our Wednesday night prayer time, and normally on Wednesday nights we do a Bible study, and uh, we're going to put that on hold just for a week because our world has been so riveted uh, by the events of the George Floyd killing and uh, all the different discussions, the really important discussions we're having around racism, and I thought it would be good to uh, connect with a friend of mine. Uh, and uh, we actually quoted her in the sermon a couple weeks ago. And uh, she, uh, she and I go way back. Carlotta, how long have we known each other? Years. Um, I started going to Joy like 96 or 97. So. All right, so it's been a lot of years. I always teasingly called her Carlotta Sales. And um, almost nobody will even get that unless you grew up in Phoenix. Uh, and. Uh, the, the car bandit or whatever his name was selling cars. Uh, and um, uh, so Carlotta Terman is with us and uh, she's, uh, she's here with her mother, Frances. And uh, I basically asked them to tell us some stories about what life is like as black women in the United States of America. And uh, we're gonna start with Frances because her life experience uh, goes back to pre MLK days. And uh, her experiences, I think, are stories we need to hear again and uh, to, to see all the, the different things that she has lived through and, and in some ways continues to live through. And then we're going to hear from Carlotta, who has a little different experience and yet similar experiences. And so, Francis, we are so grateful for you uh, telling your story. And last night we had a chance uh, to listen into you and Carlotta and, and uh, your daughter uh, talk about some of your stories. And you told some really moving stories last night. Uh, what was it like growing up uh, in those years uh, before Martin Luther King? And we were, uh, you know, really fighting for the next phase of civil rights. You, you lived in that day when you could not associate with white people. Yes. Uh, during the time before Martin Luther King was, you know, out there making something for us to all have to bring into consideration of actually what was going on uh, when uh, Rosa Parks actually sit down on the bus cause she was tired. Uh, growing up from where I came from, I always knew that my place was somewhere that I wasn't the same as everybody else. I mean, when uh, we were growing up, uh, if someone got sick, uh, we couldn't go to the doctor. And if there was a doctor, which we would find one that would come to us and care for us, he would come late at night and he would do what he had to do. And he would give us what he had and tell us how to take care of ourselves from that point on. And he wouldn't uh, have anything else to do with us. We couldn't go for follow-ups or anything like that. We were on our own because if the culture found out that he was treating the black people, then his life would be in danger. I mean, his family would be in trouble. So if we had someone like that that would come, when they would come to our house to help us, we wouldn't even say anything, uh, even to, to our own people, for fear that some of them might, you know, get in a situation where they would end up saying something, maybe to try to save their own selves. So we wouldn't even share with our own people if someone came to the house and helped us out. We just kept it quiet. Uh, when we went out in public and we met this person, he would treat us just like we were dirt. I mean, just like everybody else, he would join in with whatever it was because he didn't want them to find out who he was. But I can remember one of my experiences in one of those situations where I was looking, all these white men were around and they were saying all of these things and I was standing up and looking at them and I can remember so clearly the, the doctor that had come to the house to help us, he, he looked different while they were saying all of these things and he was standing there in the crowd but the look on his face was so different from the look on the faces of everybody else and I just felt I, even though I was the one being ostracized, I actually felt sorry for him. Mm -hmm. He looked so pitiful uh, yeah. standing there in that environment. And so that had a, had a real impact on me. But I knew that 
I couldn't say anything, you know, uh, if you found a white person that was willing to help you or do something for you, you just definitely wouldn't say anything because it could cost them their life and their parents and their uh, whole family. Did you, would be ostracized. were you living in Phoenix your whole life or did you grow up somewhere else? Uh, I grew up in uh, Florida. Florida. And uh, you were telling us uh, yesterday, we had a little family meeting with you uh, to hear some of your stories. And you talked about how uh, there was a time when you would go somewhere, you would actually have to use the bathroom before you went out because you never knew if there was going to be a place for you to use a bathroom or even to eat uh, because of the loss. Right. And that was after those, I remember those real quick, when I came, we came, we moved from Indianapolis to Phoenix. Uh, and uh when I, those experiences, when I was here in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, I can remember my family, they came and they were able to buy a, a, a house. Uh, it was a two bedroom house. There were nine of us, one bathroom. And we, I mean, we made it, we lived really good. I mean, compared to what some people had. And uh, mama would always tell us, she says, all right, everybody, there were nine of us kids. And whenever we would go out someplace, she would say, okay, everybody, go to the bathroom and use it before you leave the house. Because there wasn't any place that we could go to the bathroom. And if there happened to be a place where it said colored, you didn't want to go in there and use the bathroom. It was mm -hmm. filthy, nasty, trash. I mean, uh, I wouldn't, I have, we have two childs and I wouldn't allow my childs, <laughs> my dogs to be in that kind of environment. I mean, to take care of them. And so mom would always say, go to the bathroom before you leave. And uh, up to this day, when I leave the house and have to go someplace, I mean, it's a crazy thing, but I still have to go to the restroom before I leave sure. because that's, that's, that mentality is still there. And so I, uh, it's something that's down inside of me that I haven't been able to get rid of for some reason. But it was just that part of the experience of, you, you, of going you, you, through it. You talked last night about having some friends who insisted that you could eat at a certain restaurant. I think it was here in Phoenix. And you yes. tell us that story because uh, you were really hesitant to go and then it ended up that you should have been hesitant to go. Yes, uh, I'm, uh, when I went to a Phoenix college, uh, I joined the nursing program. I was the only uh, person of color in the whole class. Wow. And uh, all the people, all of the girls that were there, they made friends with me, they, with me. They were very nice and everything, but they will always uh, take in the middle of the class. We could all go out, you know, for lunch. I'd always bring my lunch and go sit down and eat it. Mm -hmm. And they'd all go out to lunch. So one time they asked me why I wasn't going to lunch with them. And uh, I told them, uh, I can't go to the restaurant and eat. They won't uh, uh, feed me. They'll, they'll turn me out. And uh, they said, oh, no, they won't. I said, oh, yes, they will. And uh, this went on for several weeks through nursing school and they kept on and kept on. And so finally, one day I decided, I said, I just decided myself, I said, okay, I'm gonna show you. And so they said, there was one girl in the class that had come from a family that was, had a little money. And uh, she, they had a friend in the family that owned a restaurant. And she says, well, I know where we can go. And this was a really nice place. And uh, she says, we'll go there and eat. She says, well, cause you can go and eat there. I said, no, I can't. And she says, oh yes, you can. I know you can go, cause I know him. I, you know, she knew the owner. So finally I decided, I said, okay. And I would, I, I was prepared for what would happen because I knew ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So we went in there and uh, she walked into it and she knew the owner she, and she you know, talked to him and, and they took us to this booth and we all sit down and I was kind of middle ways of the girls that in, all, all around us in this, in this booth that came to uh, wait on us and it took a little while and she said, I don't know why they take us so long. She says, uh, uh, I told them that we had to get back to class cause it was just a lunch break for us. And uh, finally, one of the clerks, I mean, one of the girls came in there and said, uh, we can't serve you until she leaves. Mm. And they looked at me and I said, I told you. And so I got up and I left 
and they all stayed and they ate. The next day when we came to class, they all shunned me, basically. I mean, I've heard it, but that's what it was. They just shunned me. And uh, from that time on through the class. Right. Unfortunately, uh, I lost you. They, can you hear me? Okay, where did you hear you me are. at? You are. Good, thanks, you're back. We lost you when you said you walked out. Oh, yes, I walked out of the restaurant and they stayed and ate. The next day when we went to uh, class in school and I came in, everybody just kind of shunned me. I mean, they didn't talk to me. They didn't be nice anymore like that. They just kind of stayed away. So from then on through the class, I mean, I went through the class and did, you know, and graduated and everything, but I was just out there yeah. <laughs> My, yeah. myself, you know, through the rest of the class. What year was that approximately? Um, I, I took and I went to um, Phoenix College in 1961. Hmm. So this was, this was a couple years before uh, Martin Luther King uh, came yes. and we, we had some change take place. But, but just for all of us to think about that, that was 1961. That was not that long ago. I mean, that's in our lifetimes for me and for you. Yeah. And, and to think that that's a, a part of our story and that that story still continues in some ways, which is why we're talking today. Um, so I, I know that you said that, uh, you know, when you go out, you still use the bathroom because it's in your head. Uh, yeah. With years of training. Do you still head out sometimes to a restaurant or to a store and think, um, you know, I'm not going to be able to stay here. Uh, I go to a store and I'm shopping and I have very good peripheral vision and I walk in and I can see what's happening around me with the clerks and how they do. Uh, it's very evident to me, you know, when I go in the store, when I go into a restaurant, um, my son and daughters, I mean, you know, they're educated and they have the income to where they take me to really nice places. But I, uh, I'm getting better at it now, but I've always felt somewhat uncomfortable because sometimes it's like, I still sometimes feel like I'm not supposed to be there. Yeah. But, uh, I know that's not the way it is. It, it, I know, I know it's okay to be there but there's that feeling when i go into a place and i'm not totally comfortable like i like i'd like to be i'd like just be to go in a restaurant and do and just not think about it but sometimes it's still there and i'm a little bit uncomfortable but i mean i've gone with my children to very nice restaurants uh that they've taken me to and it's always been really really nice i can remember uh one time going to a restaurant, a really nice place that the kids took me to. And uh, I walked into this restaurant and I looked around and it, they had all this place where you can you know, just go in and all that food was there. Uh, you should just go and serve yourself. And I looked at that and uh, it was like, I was feeling like if, if you go there and get some, somebody's gonna say, you can't go to the tape. I knew I could, right. but down inside, I still, I still couldn't. And so I went and I served myself and I sit in that restaurant and down inside me, I just wanted to cry. Mm. The fact that I was sitting there and it was okay. It was really okay. And all those emotions just welled up inside of me. And I, and I just prayed, I said, Lord, please don't let me break down here and embarrass my children because I know it would have been upsetting to them if I had let all that emotion out that I was feeling at that particular point. So I was able to hold myself in, but it was, it was quite an, an experience, just walking around the table, being able to serve myself and get the food and sit down. And the waiters would come and, you know, is there anything I can help you with? Would you like that? Would you, I mean, there was, it was just, a total environment that I wasn't used to. 
Wow. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for that. I, and I, I know that you've, you've got a lifetime of stories like that, uh, both what you went through uh, and then how life has changed somewhat anyway in the United States. Now, Carlotta, I know that um, in some ways th there's no one African-American story or experience. There's no one black experience, but you share some things in common. Uh, but you come from a little different perspective. And so talk a little bit about that. And then we'll talk about some of the things that you've experienced in your life. So my parents recognized that getting an education was really important. Um, and so they pushed us, all five of us, to get a college education, and we all did. And um, I personally, from a young age, wanted to be an attorney. And so I went to law school and got my degree. And I've been practicing for about 17 years now, I think, almost 18. Now, do you do the, so, do you do the kind of law that we see on TV all the time, these riveting shows where in that last moment, the murderer confesses. Is that the law you do? Well, I don't do criminal law, but I do, I'm a trial attorney, yes. Ah, have you ever had that Perry Mason moment? Those don't exist, so okay. no. All right, all right. <laughs> It'd probably be boring TV, I guess, wouldn't it? It would make for very boring TV, yes. Yeah. So you became a lawyer? I did, and, um, so, I mean, you know, my parents, not only did they stress education, but they were um, brave enough to move from their comfort zone and move into an area where they knew were good schools. Mm. And so that gave us an opportunity where we had the education, where we could go to college. Yeah. And um, so, you know, again, and, and, but moving out of the inner city and moving into the suburbs, that's where my experience was that I was pretty much always the only black person <laughs> in, the, in the room, okay. wherever I was. There was, I think, five um, black students out of a class of about 503 from my high school. So, um, so my experience was, you know, I, all my friends were white and, you know, everywhere I went, our first, the church we went to, we were the first, black family at our church. Um, you know, I was the first, definitely the first African American at my job at the first firm that I worked at. Um, I am still the only African American at my current firm, <laughs> even though we do have several people of color there. Mm -hmm. But um, so my experience has been just, I, I've kind of, I guess what you would say is integrated into what's considered mainstream white society. Yeah. So, so your, your experience of life has been formed in, in large part because your mom and dad really said, let's get you an education, uh, assimilating, as you say, so to speak, into more white culture. But that didn't make you immune to uh, acts of subtle or even overt racism. Not at all. Um, you know, usually my circle, you know, my trusted circle, it's a safe space. Mm -hmm. um, but anytime I go out of that trusted circle, that's where I never know what to expect. And you're always very cautious of where you go. Um, I mean, I have several stories, but I'll tell you just a couple quick ones. Scottsdale Fashion Square. I used to not shop there for the longest time because I had two bad experiences. Mm. And um, one of them was going into a record shop and with one of my friends and you know she was white or she may have it may have been one of my friends that's mexican but she looks like she's white and so we walk in they didn't bother her at all but i'm looking and i happen to look up and it was one of those where you've got on either side there's records like it's kind of that v shape and so i'm looking for something and i look up and i see one of the sales clerks on the other side then i move somewhere else into another section there he is again move somewhere else there. So he's following me around because he's convinced I'm going to take something. Yeah. So I just got angry. I left. I was just, this is ridiculous. Walked out and then I, something welled up inside me. I was like, no, I'm not letting this one go. And so I went back in there and I said something to the manager and said, you know, I'm being followed around by your clerk. And at the time I was a probation officer for Maricopa County and we carried badges. And so I actually 
showed him my badge to make a point that not only am I not a criminal, I actually work to help rehabilitate criminals. Yeah. And I wasn't trying to change his mind. I wasn't trying, you know, I just was trying to make a point. And then I walked out mm -hmm. um, and didn't shop there for a really, really long time. And when I finally did go back the first time to shop there, there was a lot of anxiety. I did not know what to expect. And I didn't know if it was going to be okay for me to be there. Yeah. Um, another experience, mom and I went, uh, we were actually at Arrowhead at one of the department stores, went to buy makeup for mom, walked up to the counter and the girl saw us and turned around and walked to the back of the counter. And we just stood there and waited for a little bit. And then somebody else came up and helped us. And you could see the other lady in the background just kind of like watching. But mom and I both picked it because I said something after we left. I said, did you see that? Mom's like, oh, of course, I saw that. We both picked it up. Yeah. Um, something else I think I had told, shared with you last night, um, the church that I grew up in, you know, I have a lot of friends. My brother had a lot of friends that we hung out with. And um, there was a, when I was, I think it was my early twenties, there was a new guy that came to church. He was white and he asked me out and we started dating. And about two months into that, he broke up with me and didn't tell me why at the time. And then I think maybe a month later, or so we talked and he shared with me that he was getting a lot of flack from his friends mm -hmm. that he was dating somebody black. And that's why he broke up with me. And that was, extremely hurtful yeah. because these are people that I thought were my friends. Uh, they were my brother's friends. So I thought, and yet, you know, this was the, their true feelings came out. Right. And all of these things add up, don't they? One incident, yeah. it's a bad guy, you know, yeah. an idiot, whatever you want to call him, but they all add up after a while and you right. just get tired of it. And even have, as you, you know, I think when you're talking about being nervous about going back to the store, you almost have this uh, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome going on there. Uh, and, and a little Absolutely. bit of what that's what mom is saying too, you know, to go back to a restaurant, all of these yeah. old feelings just come back. And, um, yeah. and, and you've, you've, you, you both are so courageous that you just keep pushing ahead and you're not going to allow this thing to have the final word in your life. But it must get wearing after a while. Oh, it is. It's 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 really hard sometimes. I mean, uh, I my way of of getting past of it is just to go and talk to the Lord. I mean, mm -hmm. and and tell him, you know, I I've said so many times here, especially recently. I said, Lord, you know, I'm going to be 80 years old next year. How, how long mm. I'm going to have to put up with this? I mean, how, how long is it? going, you know, is, is it going to be like this? Is it going to be like this all, you know, the way my life? And what, what God brought to me was how his son, he was here and how he was treated mm -hmm. and how long, I mean, people still reject him. I mean, right up to this day, people still reject him. And uh, that's what he has. He, he has his love for all people and he wants that everyone should come into his knowledge and that nobody would perish but still some of us stand out there and we you know we don't want to do it and that hurts him you know it's something that's there all the time so um he hurts too so it's just well said i said okay well said. i said okay you know yeah you know I, I i understand when you put it in that perspective so that there's a great seg Francis, because I did want to ask how faith has shaped your life. And uh, you talked a little bit about that. How about for you, Carlotta? You, you know, faith is still a part of your experience, and yet you experienced some hurt uh, in at least one church, if not more. How has faith uh, shaped your life and maybe helped you deal with this? I mean, faith is everything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, again, I think growing up for me, I anytime I encountered these situations, um, it's not like I came and I told my parents about it every single time. I, I don't know that our family necessarily always talked about all of our different experiences because number one, I know what my parents' experience were. And so some of the stuff I experienced, I didn't feel like was as bad. So, and I also didn't want to remind them of what they've been through 
and so even within our family, I think we just kind of stayed silent and just dealt with it. Um, I didn't tell my friends because my friends, you know, I didn't think they would understand. And so that's where God comes in. Like Mm -hmm. he understood, he knows, he knew my heart. He knew, um, he knew the purpose that he had for my life. And so, you know, anytime you had that pain, you didn't understand what was going on. Um, it, it, to be able to go to God and say, you know, and just cry or, or whatever I was feeling or be angry or whatever it was, and knowing that God loved me no matter what, knowing that God loves me because I am who I am. Mm-hmm. He made me uniquely. Mm-hmm. There are things I can accomplish that nobody else out there can accomplish because it's what he put inside me and the purpose he has for my life. And I mean, that, that gets me through the day every day it's gotten me through my life and it continues to get me through yeah and i think it's it's really so it really so helpful god having god in your life really really makes the difference because there have been situations in my life i'll admit it when i could have taken a machine gun and gone out and just actually kill i mean i've been to that place in my life where i just wanted to to murder somebody and yeah. It was just only because of the fact that I knew that that's not what God wanted me to do. That's not his way. And I said, you know, and I have to really, really pray about it. I said, you know, I know I said, but this is the way that I feel. This is what I want to do. You know, what else can I do? And there was nothing that I could do. I just had to take it and once again, just ask him to give me grace and help me to move on and, and uh, deal with it and just learn how to live with it. So uh, faith is something that I don't, you don't make it very well if you don't have that faith because it's kind of like, you know, the balloon's blown up and it's blown up and, and then it's ready to burst. And without that faith there, you you just you're just going to explode when i see some of the things that people are doing and some of the things that they are saying i don't agree with it Mm -hmm. but i do understand yes i understand that emotion i understand that feel i understand that rage because that's something that i also have carried so i i understand it it's not right and you just got you really have to work at not letting that take over your life and be the deciding factor in who you are, because I know God wants us to be so much more than that. That is so well said. Thank you very, very much. Well, you are both wonderful women. And I thank you so very, very much for your willingness to tell your story. I know that it's not always easy, um, but in these days, we need to hear these stories. And um, I will say this, you've got advocates at Community of Grace who are going to join you in this. And um, we're, we're not going to necessarily fix everything. We can, I don't think we can make that promise, but we're going to no. keep working, right? And um, so thank you so much. I think uh, you've been a real gift to us today. And uh, love you both. Love you, you too. Thank, thank you, you, Pastor Tim. Thank you.